Welcome to Java Fundamentals Second Edition Part 1. My name is Paul Dytel, I'm an Oracle Java Champion, and I'll be your instructor for this video course. In this Part 1 course, I'll be covering the Before You Begin section of the book, as well as the test drive of a Java application in Chapter 1, and then the full contents of Chapters 2 through 7. In addition, I provide three dive into videos that introduce you to using three of the most popular Java integrated development environments, the NetBeans IDE, the Eclipse IDE, and the IntelliJ IDEA IDE. Throughout the videos, we use what we call our live code approach. And basically what that means is I teach you each Java programming concept in the context of a complete working example rather than using code snippets and that way you see all of the concepts in the context in which they'll actually be used. Now the prerequisite for this part one course is simply programming experience in any programming language though if it's a C-based programming language that's helpful. And one of the key concepts we'll be presenting starting in part one is object-oriented programming in Java. And so you do not need to be an object-oriented programmer to watch these videos. We'll begin this course with a before you begin video in which I'll discuss the various software you'll need for programming in Java, where to get that software and how to install it, and also where to get our code examples. Finally, I'll tell you how you can get in touch with me should you have any questions as you work your way through the course. As you're working in Java, you have lots of different tools to choose from for developing your Java applications. You can use a simple text editor and Java's command line tools provided by the Java Development Kit, or you can choose from one of many different integrated development environments. The three most popular ones out there are NetBeans, Eclipse, and IntelliJ IDEA. And for each of these, we provide a separate dive into video to help you get started using the IDE. We'll show you not only where to get each IDE and how to install it, but also how to create what's known as a project, which you use to manage your Java source code files and to compile and run your applications. We'll show you how to create a project using existing source code from our examples, as well as how to create your own new programs from scratch. Now, throughout these videos, we tend to present the Java programs to you in the context of the Eclipse IDE, but the features I show you there are very similar in each of the IDEs that we present in these Dive Into videos, and in later parts of these Java Fundamentals live lessons, we also use the NetBeans IDE for certain lessons. In lesson one, we'll dive into the Java Development Kit or JDK's command line set of tools. And in particular, we'll show you how to run an existing Java application using those tools. We'll do this and discuss it for the Windows command line, which is called the command prompt, the Mac OS X command line, which is called a terminal window, and also for Linux in what would be called a shell window. In lesson two, Introduction to Java Applications, we'll begin discussing the fundamentals of Java application development. Now you'll be surprised to see all of the different little details you need to know just to be able to write the simplest Java applications. In this lesson, we'll talk a little bit about input-output, Java's primitive data types, arithmetic and relational and equality operators, as well as the if single selection statement for making decisions in your programs. In lesson three, introduction to classes, objects, methods, and strings, we begin our presentation of object-oriented programming in Java. Now this lesson is fundamental to everything you need to do in a Java program. Every single program you ever create in Java takes advantage of object-oriented programming concepts, whether you know it or not. And once we present the concepts here in lesson three, we will continue using them throughout all of the subsequent lessons as well. Now, some of the concepts that we'll present in this lesson include how to declare a class and use it to create objects in your program. We'll then talk about how to implement a class's behaviors as what are known as methods, 
and methods are used to tell an object to perform a task on your behalf. We'll also talk about how to implement a class's attributes as so-called instance variables. For example, if you're creating a class that represents a bank account, one of the attributes associated with a bank account is the balance in that account. And we'll show you how to declare variables for the purpose of storing a balance for individual account objects. We'll also show you how to call methods on an object to make them perform their tasks. We'll discuss the differences between so-called local variables declared within a method body versus instance variables of a class. We'll also talk about the differences between Java's primitive types and Java's so-called reference types. Basically, Java has only eight primitive types, and in addition to those primitive types, everything else you manipulate are considered to be reference types in Java. Finally, we'll talk about a concept called a constructor, which enables you as you're working with objects of a class and creating them for the first time to guarantee that they get initialized right from the moment they're created. In lesson four, control statements part one, we're going to take a look at three of Java's control statements. We'll revisit the if single selection statement that we introduced back in lesson two. We'll also introduce the if else double selection statement and the while repetition statement as well. And using those control statements, you can implement pretty much all forms of control that you'll ever need. But in the next lesson, we'll also show you Java's additional control statements. In addition, in this lesson, we'll take a look at the so-called compound assignment operators, which are inherited into Java from the C programming language, as well as the increment and decrement operators. In lesson five, control statements part two, we'll take a look at most of Java's other control statements, starting with the for repetition statement and the do while repetition statement, as well as introducing the switch multiple selection statement. There's also a couple of other control statements in Java, the break and continue statements, which we'll introduce here. And finally, we'll take a look at Java's logical operators for creating more complex conditions. In lesson six, methods a deeper look, we'll fill in some of the missing pieces about creating your own methods in Java. We'll also introduce the concepts of static methods and static data in a class. We'll talk about why the main method must be declared static. We'll discuss Java's primitive types again and discuss them in the context of what are known as Java's promotion rules, which affect not only mixed type arithmetic expressions, but also when you pass data into various methods to have them perform their tasks. We'll introduce some of Java's common packages in the Java API and show you a little bit about how to use the online Java API documentation. We'll introduce random number generation, named constants with Java's enum types, the scope of identifiers throughout a class, and also a concept called method overloading in which you declare multiple methods in the same class that all have the same name but different parameter lists. In lesson seven, arrays and array lists, we begin our introduction to data structures in Java. We'll talk about one-dimensional and multi-dimensional arrays. We'll talk about the remaining control statement in Java, the so-called enhanced for statement, which is meant specifically for iterating through all of the elements of an array, or as you'll see later, a collection object as well. We'll demonstrate how to pass arrays to methods, how to write methods that can receive variable length argument lists, which are actually implemented underneath the hood with array parameters. We'll talk about the main methods command line arguments that are passed into the args parameter of main as an array of strings. We'll also show you how to build an object-oriented gradebook case study, first with a one-dimensional array representing a set of grades on one quiz, and then with a two-dimensional array representing 10 students' quiz grades on three exams. 
Towards the end of this lesson, we'll introduce a class called Arrays that contains many static methods for common array manipulations, and we'll also take a look at the Array List Collection class, which is a dynamically resizable array-like data structure. If you like what you see in these videos and are interested in having me come on site to present instructor-led training at your company, please feel free to visit us at ditalcom training. If you have any questions at all while you work your way through these videos, feel free to contact me at the email address or social media pages that you see on your screen. Now, when we're doing the research for our books, we like to create what we call resource centers that contain links to all of the online resources we found helpful in doing our research. If you're interested in seeing those online resources, visit us at ditel.com slash resourcecenters.html. I hope you enjoy these live lessons videos.